Yeah. Yeah, broadcast is live. Chris Anderson. Rick Byer. How you doing? The bar is open here at uh, History Happy Hour. How's it going for you? Going well. Greetings from London. Greetings from Chicago. So uh, we're going to have a great show, and we have a great guest today. But we also have, Chris, something else very exciting to start with. What could be better than that? We have a snazzy new open oh, for History Happy Hour. Maybe you can open and a close. We'll play it both times okay. right? for, for making sure that everybody sees it. But are you ready for it? I'm ready for it. All right, here we go. Maybe. <laughs> All right, here we are. Then wow. you're officially now welcome to uh, to History Happy Hour, and so we welcome everybody who's joining us. And please, uh, on the comments page, please say hello to us. Uh, and uh, we're glad that you guys are here. Um, so Chris, do you have a cocktail? Uh, I do. With you? Do you have enough? It could uh, be I have enough. to make it enough. It looks, it looks like you have Ooh. to arrange it a little bit. Um, so I want to introduce our guest today. Our guest, uh, we have very excited to have him joining us, uh, is acclaimed military historian and Churchill biographer Andrew Roberts, and he's going to be joining us from London. Uh, the New York Times called his 2018 book Churchill Walking with Destiny the best single volume um, biography of Churchill yet written, which is an awesome uh, statement to make. And uh, it is one of 19 books, if I have the number correct, that Andrew has authored or edited. I also am a big fan of his book, Mastering Commanders. And I know, Chris, you really liked his book, uh, his Napoleon book. And um, Andrew is a journalist who approaches history uh, like a journalist. And given the tenor of the times, I guess I should say I mean that as a compliment. And so we are joined now from London by Andrew Roberts. Andrew, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be on the show. Thank you. And do you have your cocktail equivalent with you? I, not with me, no, no. I you're saving it for later. I understand. He's a professional. He's a professional. Actually, as a Chicagoan, you will appreciate my favorite is the South Side. Uh, ah. Yeah, okay. and, uh, lime. It's absolutely delicious. Uh, we, we will keep that in mind. Um, Andrew, we are talking to you on uh, the 80th anniversary of the day that Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Great Britain. And May 10th, 1940 is really one of the most momentous days in the history of World War II, in the life of Winston Churchill, uh, and in the story of uh, Great Britain overall. So I wonder if you could set the scene uh, a little bit of what happened that day and why it's such an important day in history. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Well, just before dawn on um, the 10th, Friday the 10th of May, uh, 1940, Adolf Hitler unleashed Blitzkrieg on the West, invading Belgium and, and uh, Holland and Luxembourg, shortly afterwards also, of course, to invade France. And it was also the same day, quite co coincidentally, that um, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Britain. There had been a debate over the previous um, Wednesday and Thursday about whether or not um, it was going to uh, be Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister, who continued on, but um, but actually it was decided instead by a small group of uh, of people at Downing Street that Winston Churchill was going to be, and he went to uh, Buckingham Palace that evening, and uh, and the King made him Prime Minister, and very famously he wrote in his uh, in his war memoirs the last paragraph of the first volume of his war memoirs, The Gathering Storm. Um, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life I had had a preparation for this hour and for this trial. And, and you know, you in, in talking about that quote, you have said that um, uh, it's destiny, but in Churchill's case, his whole life, and this really is one of the themes of this book, Walking with Destiny, his whole life is about shaping that destiny. It's not just something that happened to him, it's something that he made happen. 
Precisely, absolutely right. He wasn't, I mean, he believed in the concept of fate and providence and chance, of course, uh, luck, but um, he was also extremely hardworking in making sure that the, um, that the risk element was as small as possible and that he had every uh, possible chance of becoming prime minister. There were three or four earlier occasions when he could have become prime minister, but each time he was prevented uh, from doing that, sometimes by his own terrible blunders. He made mistake after mistake, Winston Churchill, but he learned from all of them. And by the time he came, became prime minister, he was 65 years old. It was really his pretty much his last chance. And, uh, and he had molded uh, fate in the best way possible for himself. Chris? Well, one of the things I, I've been curious about is um, when you decided to take up Churchill as a subject, you know, that was that was pretty well-trodden ground. First of all, what brought you to the subject? And did anybody <laughs> try to talk you out of it? Or, um, you know, what did you think that you could bring to the table? Kind of yes, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. There are, in fact, 1,009 biographies. Of oh, my God. Yeah, so my my book was the one thousand and tenth, uh, and and you're quite right. Some people did uh, say to me, other authors, by and large, you know, you'd you'd meet them at literary parties, and they go, "What on earth can you possibly say about Winston Churchill that nobody else has?" Um, but the answer is that very fortunately, I managed to write that book, or at least research that book, at a time when there was a whole host of new sources that became available. Um, Her Majesty the Queen allowed me to be the first Churchill biographer to use her father, King George VI, diaries, wartime diaries. And um, Churchill met the King every Tuesday of the Second World War. They had lunch together at Buckingham Palace and they served themselves from the side tables because wow. nobody else could be present because the King was trusted by Churchill with all of the great secrets of the Second World War the nuclear secret, the enigma secret, which countries were going to be invaded, which ministers and generals were going to be appointed and sacked and so on. And uh, the king fortunately wrote everything down. But on top of that, there's also been 51 sets of papers that have been deposited at Churchill College um, archives at uh, Cambridge University, including the diaries of his daughter, um, Mary Soames, the American, I'm so sorry, the Soviet ambassador, Ivan Meitke, his diaries have been published in Moscow, so we now know all about the relationship between uh, Churchill and uh, and Meitke, who we saw a lot of, of course. Um, and the Churchill family allowed me to use papers that hadn't been used before. So all in all, uh, it was very lucky that I happened to write the book at exactly the time that there was this avalanche of new information. Yeah. Well, I must say, I mean, when I, when I first saw the book, it, it's it's a weighty tomb, and I, I remember picking it up at the bookshop and thinking, "Oh my God, what could he possibly be saying that it's new?" Um, there we go. See, Fortunately, uh, don't put people off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I remember my my daughter worked at the bookshop and she brought it home for me, and and it, it was just so compelling, and I didn't feel that I was reading kind of the same old thing. So I was just. No. Um, well, you, you start off, of course, with a bit of a head start with uh, with Churchill, partly because people do know the outlines of the story, at least the set a bit when he's prime minister in the Second World War. You know, they have a good sense of it. Right. Um, and the second thing is it's just so much fun because he's so funny and yeah. you never have to read much more than three pages, even in the most sort of serious budget speech when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, without coming across some fabulous joke or aperçu or some turn of phrase that makes the uh, makes the reading of it um, just great fun. Yeah. You know, Andrew, when you were talking about the, the diaries of uh, King George, um, I was struck by the um, entry for May 10th um, when he says that um, Chamberlain came to see him and, of course, uh, the Germans have invaded uh, the lowlands uh, 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 and France, and um, uh, the government is in crisis. The prime minister is coming to see him to resign. And then he says he has, uh, he said, then we had a little informal talk 
about who his successor might be. And you couldn't resist the footnote. I'm an inevitable in, in, a reader of footnotes. You couldn't resist saying, um, you know, essentially, how, how could that be an informal talk, given that you're, you're talking about your successor as prime minister uh, during a world war? I mean, what, what could be more formal? To the king. To the king. <laughs> right. But, but yes. there is a One wonders under those circumstances what a formal talk. <laughs> yeah. uh, they'd have to be in regalia of some kind, <laughs> I would imagine. I guess now we know that King George's uh, uh, um, definition of formal. I'm going to bring in a, a first question that we have from some other folks here, because that's actually a question on, on my list as well. And so this is from Andy Arends. Uh, and he's here in the Chicago area, and he wants to know how important was Churchill's rhetorical skill to his leadership? Was it the most important skill or was something else? Um, well, his rhetorical skill is a very good question, um, and he was absolutely central because, of course, Britain was, to all intents and purposes, defeated uh, in the first three weeks of Churchill's premiership. The British Expeditionary Force was forced off the continent. Uh, France had fallen. The uh, Russians were actually allied to the Germans at that stage. And also the Americans were showing no interest in, uh, in joining as, uh, as a um, power, however much uh, moral support they were giving um, the allies. So actually we had, um, we'd been beaten uh, in this country. And the key thing was that Winston Churchill knew it, the British people knew it, but he was still able to um, fight off demoralization through the um, use of his oratory, of his rhetorical powers. Whether it was the most important skill, I mean, it was a tremendously important skill, but I don't think it was the most important uh, one. I think I'd agree with him that the most important one, of course, was coming up with the grand strategy, which I'm sure we'll be talking about later. Um, of how to employ the um, the power of the United Kingdom and the Empire, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, India, and so on, uh, ultimately to be a useful force with the other allies in in defeating Nazism. Um, and and I want to. Um... Uh, just mentioned in talking about the uh, oratory, one of the things that, that I thought that you really um, uh, made really clear as well is that Churchill's oratory is not simply a, a, a natural gift or, or something that just you know, descends upon him, that he is from his early 20s sort of building a, a scaffolding and a structure for his oratory, studying, preparing, uh, and, and it's, it's a lifelong pursuit. That's right. And it's, it's good that you mentioned the word scaffolding, because, of course, in 1897, uh, he wrote an article entitled The Scaffolding of Rhetoric. And uh, at that stage, he was only 23 years old, and he'd never given a public speech in his life. And so for the rest of us, uh, we, we speak in public and then come up with a sort of theory about what's good and what's bad. But then he started with the theory and then put it into practice. And as you say, he wasn't a natural speaker. He was um, actually uh, required notes to speak all the way through his life. And, um, and when he tried to speak without notes in 1904, he's, he was forced to sit down and put his head in his hands and people started to worry about him. Um, and so instead he used what he called psalm form, in which he would take the key words in any sentence every sentence that he was going to speak. And, uh, and he put them down in the middle of the page on page after page of notes. And if you go to the Churchill archives in Cambridge, you can see all these notes, many of them hand uh, scribbled over the, uh, with his handwriting over the typed pages, because he would be constantly um, bringing the, uh, the speeches up to perfection, even moments before he got up and, and delivered them. So Rick, I, I, I don't want to, if we have questions from the guests, you'll have to read them out because so I, I can't see them. But uh, while I have an opportunity, one of the things that I've been curious about, since obviously it's mostly an American uh, audience tonight, Churchill is one of these figures historically that um, I don't think is too much of a stretch to say that he's almost become universal or an American hero as well. Um, 
where do you think that affinity or that connection, why are Americans so drawn to him? Well, of course, his mother was American, so he himself yeah. was half American. Um, and I think it's much easier to be drawn to somebody who does uh, have at least 50% of your blood. Um, he loved America. Uh, he visited America 16 times in his life, which um, considering back in the 1890s, that was quite a, uh, when he started to go to America, that was quite a process. Uh, he visited 26 of your states, uh, which was far more than any other contemporary British uh, histori of, uh, British politician of the day. Um, I think that um, you Americans enjoy really good writing. And of course, he wrote 37 books and he sold more copies uh, in America even than he sold in England. So, so there was something about his, his literary capacity. And of course, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature that I think has always appealed to Americans. He had some of his most uh, um, high and low moments in uh, in America. Low, of course, the moment he very nearly died when he was run over on Seventy Sixth Street uh, in New York City. Um, but also some wonderful moments as well, especially in his trip around uh, America in 1929. The only thing, of course, that uh, cast a pall over that, um, apart from the uh, Wall Street crash, was uh, prohibition. Which <laughs> Can understand Winston Churchill uh, was not in favour of, but uh, nonetheless, he was um, he was somebody who all his life had a great affinity for uh, the United States. Um, let me bring in a, a question here from uh, one of our our viewers, and it goes back to your to your research. Uh, he, Rich Randall asks: Was there anything in the new source materials, diaries, and so on that contradicted? past biographies or confirmed what might have only been theory in the past? So I think that's a terrific question. It is a very good question. The answer is yes, there was an awful lot in the King's Diaries that did exactly that. Um, I think one of the things was that, of course, having said that how much he, he loved America, he was highly critical of the fact that the Roosevelt administration had not been moving, or at least had been moving at a glacially slow pace towards bellicosity. But this is something he couldn't say in Parliament or in Cabinet or uh, to MPs or to the public. But he could tell the King, because he knew that the King was um, uh, was very good at keeping secrets and, um, and also wasn't after his job. And so as a result, <laughs> he was able to be um, the sounding board that Churchill used, really. And, um, and one of the things that he did do was to um, make make criticisms of uh, of the Roosevelt administration, and because he understood that uh, the Second World War was a Manichaean struggle between good and evil, um, and between democracy and civilization on one side, and the most evil dictatorship ever to smirch human history on the other, and he couldn't really understand why the greatest democracy on earth, America at the time, was unable, and indeed today was unable to um, to um, get involved more than it he than it was. He, he understood it intellectually, of course he did, he was a highly intelligent man, but he emotionally um, needed occasionally to sort of vent in 1940 and up until December 1941, uh, when Hitler declared war on America, um, and he did so to the king. So that was some aspect that I, an important aspect, that I wasn't expecting particularly because you don't get a hint of it anywhere else. But when I found it, I, of course, said to myself, of course, that's the way Churchill felt. And of course, he used uh, the king as a sort of almost like a psychiatrist's um, couch to, uh, to, to vent. Well, that really came out in the biography. I know, I mean, given what I hadn't known about Churchill, he seemed very reverent of the royal family and it was very important to him. And so to, to read your biography, to have almost that closeness that you're talking about between him and the king coming out in that, it's not something that I had at first expected. I thought it would be a much more formal relationship. Um, yes, that's right. Well, I mean, you've got to remember, of course, that they could. That there's a perfectly good chance they wouldn't have got on with one another because um, the king had been a huge supporter of the policy of appeasement, a staunch supporter of Neville Chamberlain. And uh, of course, the king knew that Churchill had been a great supporter 
of the king's elder brother, Edward VIII, later Duke of Windsor, during the abdication crisis. And so it there could have been the case that the prime minister and king didn't get on with one another, didn't see eye to eye, but they did very quickly. By the time of the Blitz and the Battle of Britain, they, they I mean, they in the diaries, the king refers to Churchill as his friend, and he's the only one of the king's four prime ministers who he calls by his Christian name. Wow. So they got on very well very early on. Yeah. Uh, another question, there's actually a couple here uh, on the same topic, but I'll put one up from uh, one of our viewers on YouTube, Jerry Fritz, who asks, what was Churchill's opinion of FDR? Did he believe FDR to be honest and trustworthy or conniving and political? Uh, and there's also a, a second question about his relationship uh, uh, political and personal with FDR. So I think we can put those all in one in one question. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for those questions. Um, he liked FDR. Yes, he uh, he liked him, and they got on well. Uh, he of course went to live with FDR in the White House for three weeks after Pearl Harbor. Um, he didn't like the cocktails that FDR mixed for him. He thought they were pretty filthy. Um, but nonetheless, uh, he got on very well personally. They were they both came from the same kind of aristocratic background of their own countries. The New Deal concept overlaps a lot with the Tory democracy ideas of, uh, of Churchill. So politically, they weren't far apart either. Um, and he had admired um, FDR for, uh, for much of the 30s. And fortunately, he had written a very nice thing about him in his book in 1938, uh, Great Contemporaries, and FDR was was happy to read that, as you can imagine. Um, they had a, um, a close and friendly relationship, but by 1944, by certainly the fall of 1944, it had pretty much broken down. Um, the best interests of the American Republic seemed to have diverged from those of the British Empire, criticisms of the British Empire were made in the Roosevelt administration that uh, Churchill wasn't happy about. And um, in the there are about 200 more uh, letters and, um, and telegrams from Winston Churchill than there are um, replies from FDR, who of course was ill by, by the fall of 1944. Um, and so by the time they uh, they had got to Yalta, there were serious disagreements between them. And um, and actually you see that starting really from the Tehran conference of November 1943. But, um, but nonetheless, when he finally said goodbye to FDR in Cairo in, uh, I'm so sorry, in Alexandria in February 1945, and realized that he wasn't going to see FDR again, he, he, he'd seen the sort of death pall on the president by then, he was um, he was emotionally moved by that. Um, Andrew, I, I, I'm curious, and we will come back to some of the Churchill history specifically in a moment, but I'm curious, um, uh, as, as a writer, you, you, know, you said that Churchill wrote 37 books, and you, so you have a ways to go, but it seems like you're well on the path uh, at this point. <laughs> And I think Chris and I, uh, as writers ourselves, would both like to know how you do it. Um, but more specifically, I also wanted to ask you about research. Um, <clears throat> Churchill, of course, had a lot of research help, William Deacon and other people assisting in his research at various times in his career. Uh, do you uh, have a research team? Are you doing the research yourself? Uh, you know, and, and what, what can you, what clues can you give us about how one can be so successful and so prolific a writer because we could both use the help. <laughs> uh, that's, <laughs> that's very kind of you. Um, well, I, I, I know I know that you've actually had a book on the New York Times bestseller list, so I, you're being over modest, it strikes from, me. From your mouth to God's ear. You only know that because Chris insisted on mentioning it before the broadcast, but that's okay. We'll take yeah, but, it. Um, <laughs> um, well, it's kind of you to say all those nice things. I I think um, I've never used a research assistant in my life, I and I and I won't. Um, part of it is is because research is so much fun. I don't want to have to uh, do it with anybody. And secondly, because um, I don't want to um, to use somebody else's work um, at all. It it strikes me as being uh, a um, uh, dangerous thing to do. 
much, much um, more fun and interesting is to do it all yourself. However, um, of course, it does mean much more hard work. I had to take some six million words of notes for the um, for the Churchill book, which wound up being over half a million words long. Um, it took me four years to research, but it only took me a hundred days to write. I, I write fast at the rate of about five thousand words a day. And so I did that. I did that book. I wrote the whole of that book in three months. I'm giving up. <laughs> and, uh, and I know that, that. By the way, that gets me a great deal of hatred from other authors. Yeah. When I mentioned. We're going to have some hatred coming to you from here. I can. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, okay. I perfectly understand that. Um, I don't the, think I can type that fast. The way the way to do it is um, to get up very very early in the morning. I start work at four or or four thirty or so in the morning when I'm writing, um, and concentrate really until uh, lunchtime. And the wonderful thing about writing in the in the early morning is that nobody calls you and you have a chance really to get very deep into it. And then after lunch, I drink a, a um, I'm not very, I'm sure it's not very good for you, but it's a, I think it's an American drink called Red Bull, which <laughs> is a caffeine drink. And uh, you put on quite a lot of weight, I, I have to say. But nonetheless, you, I have one of those a day after lunch and that keeps you sort of buzzing. And <laughs> I had to go to bed and you can get an awful lot done. My wife tells me that when I was writing chapter 10 of the um, of the Churchill book, which is the Gallipoli campaign chapter, which is a very important and quite complicated thing that you have to get in your own mind in order to make it simple for the reader to, um, to read and uh, hopefully understand. Um, she says that I spent three days in my dressing gown and pyjamas and slippers and didn't wash. <laughs> which, uh, it sounds very unhygienic, and I can't really remember as whether that's true or not. But nonetheless, um, these these kind of things can sort of overtake you slightly. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I I I I will I will hand over to Chris for another question in a moment. But I, the, the the two best quotes um, uh, I've ever heard about writing uh, history are my two favorites. One is the uh, uh, the 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 idea of the BIC method of writing, which is butt in chair. You can't really do it unless your butt is in the chair. And the other one is what um, Robert Caro was told when he was a young reporter by the managing editor of his newspaper, who had just made him an investigative reporter: turn every page, never assume anything, turn every goddamn page. Uh, as far as the research goes, sounds like that's what you're doing. Well, you have to really, and also, um, it's, it's the it's the last page. Uh, it's the page that every all the other researchers have not turned that gives you that special thing, that little bit of nugget of information, that special edge, which your readers are um, buying your books in order to see. And um, I've been incredibly. Uh, fortunate in uh, finding out various things in books that I've written over the years, but it's usually because uh, when somebody says, "Oh, there's a you know train at five thirty, are you going to stop now?" You go, "No, no, no, I'll get the train that's at six thirty because there's one more box in this attic here of this very kind person who's let me go through his great grandfather's papers, and um, I'll miss that train. I'll take the next one." And it turns out, of course, to have the uh, piece of information that you've been uh, searching for all day and missing up until that point. So there's a sort of element of terror, of uh, fear of missing out, which I think is an important aspect of the historian's trade. <laughs> True. So I, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and, I, and we'll get back to Churchill because I know I don't want this to be very selfish in our conversation, but your books are about these incredibly large personalities, um, Napoleon, um, Churchill, obviously. Uh, is there somebody of that stature um, who you think has not had a biography done yet or um, not a good biography? He's well, not going to tell you, Chris. I have to tell well, you, uh, Chris, Chris, Chris that if, there, if sure. there were, I would not tell you. Oh, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> there are very, very few people uh, like that um, who uh, 
<laughs> who haven't had a, a good biography. I mean, sometimes I will actually be as as sort of cold hearted as to go down the list of all the prime ministers and foreign secretaries and uh, and you know war ministers and just see who has and who hasn't had a, a, a kings and queens, presidents and so on. I mean, uh, and and it's very very difficult to find somebody who who hasn't. Um, but I have got somebody in mind, and uh, you'll find out in about five years' time. Who right, and, and to be honest, I, I really, I was just trying to think of like overlooked personalities or you know historical figures. That were oh no, there are lots of those. There are lots of those. People I was who, that for who, your, no, yeah. people who no, no, very few people have heard of, but nonetheless, who you think is an absolutely key figure, or a or a much under um, estimated or or misunderstood figure. Oh yeah. There are lots of those, and the great thing is that um, it's like lightning striking. If you get somebody like that um, and uh, can write a very successful book about it, sometimes they can be really runaway bestsellers. I'm thinking about the lady um, uh, Hildebrand, uh, yeah. who did that fabulous book about the gentleman who was uh, shot down over um, uh, occupied China and so on. Yeah. Sometimes you can you can hit uh, hit the wave and um, and it's and it's absolutely uh, uh, brilliant of course you know a, a funny story about that book or about that topic is that um, my dad's cousin spent 42 days in a lifeboat after his um, uh, merchant ship was sunk his liberty ship and um, and I uh, had interviewed him and I had his papers and I proposed it to my publisher as a book. And they said, oh no, um, <clears throat> you know, we just recently published a book about somebody who went through an experience like that and it didn't sell, so those books don't sell. And, ah. <laughs> and, and, then, and then it years, sold, it sold it was, five million copies or something, didn't it? It was Nick Reedy's <laughs> autobiography. It was the same guy, it, but he wrote it and nobody bought it. She wrote it, and and it and she made it a great story, which is of course yeah. the object lesson. It's how you tell the story, but yeah. but it's also publishers and and movie um, uh, producer people. Oh, so we did something like that, and it didn't work. And you're like, yeah. no, it's not the same. Yes. Yeah. No. Exactly. Um, I do have another question. We'll go back. We'll, we'll get out of our, our personal questions about your writing, although I'm... Honey, order the Red Bull. Okay. <laughs> we're, um, <clears throat> we have a question here about uh, the relationship between Eisenhower and Churchill. And did Churchill have to play peacemaker between the U.S. military leadership and British military leadership? Um, yes. Um, they, again, had a very good... Um, uh, personal relationship, very good working relationship. Um, everyone liked Ike, of course, but Churchill was one of the people who liked Ike. Um, he sometimes Ike had to stand up to Churchill on a number of occasions, and uh, Churchill respected that. Primarily, of course, because he knew that George Marshall, um, the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, was one hundred percent behind Ike, and Ike was his protege, and um, and Marshall was Ike's mentor. And so there, there was a power, as there always is between generals, um, there was a power play, uh, and certainly between generals and politicians. And um, and the key figure here was, was Marshall as much as anybody else. Churchill didn't really play um, peacemaker between the British and the American um, generals. That was done by Field Marshal Dill, uh, in the um, in Washington, the British uh, soldier, former chief of the Imperial General Staff, and there were a number of occasions when um, uh, Marshall rubbed up against um, General Allen Brook, later Field Marshal Lord Allen Brook, the wrong way. I mean, they were um, they liked each other, admired each other as people, but they did not see eye to eye at all when it came to grand strategy, and each was the um, driving force behind, in Marshall's case, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and in um, Alan Brooks case, the British Chiefs of Staff. So you needed some oil between the uh, these these grinding um, pieces of machinery, and the oil was General Dill, and also to a lesser extent Churchill's 
military secretary um, Pagisme. But Churchill himself stood well back from that, uh, and it wasn't expected for a prime minister or indeed a, a president to uh, um, to expend capital trying to get these guys getting on with one another. And and General Dill, I should say. Um... I think I'm correct here, but I have two experts on with me, so if I'm wrong, I'm sure that we will get the correct information. Uh, General Dill is the only, either the only or one of the only um, uh, uh, British uh, subjects buried at Arlington National Cemetery. So that's right, with, with that fabulous uh, equestrian statue. Right. That, um, and, and, and actually not buried not far from General Marshall. Now, um, oh, go ahead, Rick. No, I was looking at you, Chris, because I, I was waiting with bated breath for your question. <laughs> okay, well, one of the questions I had, um, I was very close with uh, Dr. Weiss from, from King's College, and, and we would have a lot of discussions because he was an American that had moved to London, taught at a British university, veteran of the war. Um, and I remember at one point I mentioned the special relationship between our two countries. And he kind of, I got a loud harumph and a pasha, and he said, you know, countries act in their own self-interest and that is all window dressing that was put on after. Um, uh, and uh, I was just kind of curious what your thoughts were. Is that a real thing that you I, I, more? I'm afraid I don't agree with him uh, at all. I think that when Churchill made the um came up with the with the phrase special relationship in his great harvard speech in september 1943 he really genuinely had um hit on something mm -hmm. uh, he had spotted that there actually are and of course nations follow their own uh, best interests but nonetheless when best interests overlap quite as much as the british and the americans did for much of the second world war i'm not saying for all of it but for much of it then you can ha create a special relationship. And um, I've read the obituary now of at least a dozen people who've written the obituary of the special relationship. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's, it, 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 still, it still works. You know, when one looks at um, nuclear policy, when one looks at intelligence gathering, the five eyes, when one looks at investments in each other's countries, when one looks at what we have in common compared to uh, some of our protagonists and antagonists, I think the special relationship is something that um, it's not just pure luck that Ronald Reagan got on with Margaret Thatcher and George Bush got on with Tony Blair and your president at the moment gets on with um, Boris Johnson and uh, FDR and Macmillan getting on with uh, JFK. You know, it's this is not just personal chemistry. It's the fact that we have got values, we've got our language, we've got our history, both positive and negative, but overall really positive. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got our legal system and Magna Carta and so on, which means that we have far more in common than our enemies would uh, like. I like that answer. I should have mentioned that to Steve. You, you answer Steve much better than I could. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, you mentioned earlier in our conversation that you thought that Churchill's oratory was important but not as important as his development of grand strategy. And you said, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. And so I'm making that come true now by asking you to uh, go a little further with that comment and tell people about the grand strategy and Churchill's role in it. Well, um, I, I, of course, uh, in my book, Masters and Commanders, um, which you've kindly mentioned earlier, argue that the grand strategy ah that's what i like to see thank <laughs> you he always always makes a, an author smile when he sees uh, that happen on a tv screen thank you um it um i can i believe that you can see the grand strategy of the western allies from 1941 to 45 through the prism of the interaction of those four men who we've already mentioned brooke marshall fdr and churchill and the um, decision to fight first in North Africa, in the European theater, of course, this is first in um, North Africa, and then across, uh, going across into um, Sicily in July, 1943, over onto the mainland of Italy in September, 1943, 
and then only cross over the uh, English Channel the day after the fall of Rome. That, which is a strategy which I'm very happy to uh, argue about, to discuss the pros and cons of it, because I know that there's a very strong American historical revisionist element that doesn't believe that it was the right strategy to adopt. Nonetheless, it was something that uh, President Roosevelt supported against the um, against the initial um, ideas and views of uh, General Marshall. So he effectively joined Brooke and Churchill to um, to go along with the Mediterranean strategy until such time um, as a, as it turned out the Quebec Conference in 1943 that he recognised that you had to get over the Channel. Um, if you were going to liberate Western Europe before the Russians uh, got into uh, Berlin and beyond. So there is a, a huge, I mean, there, there were 10 major conferences where those four men got together. And um, from the first to the last, there were immensely hard fought uh, discussions. And you would have Marshall sometimes slamming his fist on the desk and you'd have General um Brooke breaking pencils in half in front of the Prime Minister's face, uh, and so on. Uh, Albert Wedemeyer, the General Wedemeyer, Anglophobic American general, threatening to lean over and punch sock. I think the, exp the expression was sock Brooke in the jaw. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, these arguments were hard fought because the lives of tens of thousands of men were um, potentially at stake. There's a wonderful line from the British historian. Um, um, Lewin, um, I can't remember his first name, where he said that um, that there will always be great discussions about the grand strategy of the Second World War, um, and that there's no rule of law that says that um, that uh, men can die in battle, but that staff officers should not be vexed. <laughs> and of course, they were very heavily vexed, and understandably so. Chris, I was, I was just, I know that we'd gotten a question earlier from uh, one of our listeners about kind of your thoughts comparison. It's a big question, but between Churchill and another one of your subjects, Napoleon, um, if they're yes. that's a big yes, one. Yes, yes, yes. That is that's another very good question. Um, well, Churchill, of course, looked up to Napoleon enormously. Sure. He um, he had Napoleon a bust of Napoleon on his uh, desk. He had a um, uh, he had he read lots of books about Napoleon. I think he had about 160 books on Napoleon, specially bound in green Napoleonic leather uh, in his library. You can see it, them all at uh, Churchill College. Um, he would he would uh, often use Napoleonic phrases and um, and deliberately so to uh, in, in letters and so on. So Napoleon did matter to him. I think they had a couple of things in common. The first, of course, was this sense of destiny that we mentioned. Napoleon had, had he followed his star, he used to say. Um, he, they both uh, referred to luck and uh, contingency and chance uh, in female terms that one could woo them. Uh, and, uh, of course, um, Napoleon was to say, that uh, she had turned her back on him, uh, this idea that fate was no longer on his side. Um, then there was a, um, a driving ambition in both men. Um, and although ambition is sometimes denigrated, especially um, in, uh, in Britain, actually, if it's allied to great talent, and in both Napoleon and Churchill's uh, case, it certainly was, I think that there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it would be in some way actually um, turning against nature if you're not ambitious, if you're that talented. And both men showed great talent, of course, very young in their lives. Um, Napoleon was 26 at the Battle of Lodi when he captured um, Milan, and uh, and Napoleon and Churchill was 25 when he escaped from the prisoner of war camp and became famous throughout the empire. Um, I want to, uh, uh, we're, we're going to jump around a little bit, Andrew, and I apologize for that, but we are, we have many questions that people have posed and we're trying Great. to give them a chance to ask some of them to you directly. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a couple here. 
Uh, and we have a question from Robert Coleman, who said, uh, did Churchill think that Halifax played a key role as U.S. ambassador? And of course, he's talking about Lord Halifax, who was originally one of the appeasers. Uh, or was he just glad to move him out of the foreign ministry in favor of Anthony Eden? Um, it was the, the, the second thing first, in that he was uh, keen to get Anthony Eden in as foreign secretary and Halifax out. Um, but very soon afterwards, he did realize that actually Halifax was a, was a good ambassador to, uh, to Washington. And he, um, he wasn't necessarily expecting that, and neither was Halifax, because Halifax didn't... I wrote a biography of Halifax um, in 1991. Oh, and I don't have that one right here, sorry. <laughs> not to worry, not to worry. Um, I think I've met every person who has read that book. No, yes, yes, well, the, the um, Holy Fox, right? Yes. The Holy Fox, exactly that. And, um, and one of the things that surprised me when I was writing that um, book was that Halifax did turn out to be a good ambassador to America because he was quite um, uh, standoffish. He certainly wasn't a hail fellow, well met, backslapping kind of figure at all. He was the exact opposite, really, a rather haughty um, aristocrat. But nonetheless, he managed to uh, to get on well with the Americans and do a very good job. And so, actually, uh, the um, Mr. Coleman's question is uh, an absolutely uh, brilliant one, really, because the fact is that he started off with one and then managed to get to get both. And of course, he became a great friend and almost father figure, surrogate father almost, to Anthony Eden, um, who he uh, he didn't always treat well, especially not in his second premiership, but um, his peacetime premiership. But um, but ultimately, they were a very good team during the Second World War. Uh, Chris, can I throw in another question? No, I'm going to let you take the lead. Otherwise, I'll just hog up all the questions. No, you can. You can <laughs> Dude, you as many questions as you want. <laughs> um, well, well, I'll do one more, then we'll come back to you. All right. So uh, uh, we have a question here from Neil Shara. At what point did Mr. Churchill realize the threat of the Soviet Union and the curse of an Iron Curtain? And I'm going to modify that question a little bit, Andrew, to talk about whether... Churchill's attitude towards the Soviet Union, towards Russia first and then the Soviet Union, was uh, inconsistent over the years or consistent over the years? Because I think there's a, you've made a point about that in your book. Yes, I did, absolutely. Um, he started off being pro Russian. Um, and in fact, the Gallipoli campaign in 1915 was intended in part to help Russia. Uh, he then in 1917 became anti-Russian at the time that Lenin and Trotsky overthrew the Tsarist government. He then became pro-Russian in 1941, um, when he immediately had created an alliance, even without asking the king or the cabinet, um, after operation, at the time of Operation Barbarossa. Um, he then, in the 1950s, uh, sorry, in 1946, he, of course, gave the great Iron Curtain speech on the 5th of March and, um, and became anti-Russian. And then in 1950, in his peacetime premiership in about 1953, he became pro-Russian again. So it's perfectly easy to argue um, that, in fact, he was wildly inconsistent all the way through his life on Russia. But I don't argue that, because in each of those cases, one can see that ultimately British um, national interest depended on each of those changes of, um, of policy, changes of stance. One thing that he was always entirely consistent over was hating communism. Uh, he believed that it was a moral evil that was corrosive to the human soul. And, um, and he never stepped back from that, even when we were allied to the Soviet Union in 1941 uh, to 45. But, to go to Neil uh, Shara's question, um, he was the first major Western politician to, and for some time actually the only Western politician, to warn against uh, Soviet imperialism immediately after the Second World War. That Iron Curtain speech that he gave in Fulton, Missouri uh, in March 1946 was denounced 
by the um, British government. The, Rose, uh, the uh, Truman administration distanced themselves uh, from it. He was attacked in the press. He had uh, in both Congress and Parliament, there were, um, there were motions against, set against him. It was, um, it, it was a brave thing to have done politically. And uh, he was proved so right so quickly when Stalin imposed his um, his totalitarian dictatorship across the whole of Eastern Europe in exactly the way that um, Churchill, in ringing tones in Missouri, had said that he was going to. Chris? Well, <laughs> um, one of the questions I, I get on every trip, uh, at one point during the trip, and I'm sure I give a ham fisted answer is how was it that Churchill was defeated in 1945 and forced from office? I know uh, Americans just, they don't really understand how that happened and um, how he took well, it. Well, I think ha had it been a presidential, had we had a presidential system like you have, it wouldn't have happened, but he was only one name on 650 ballot papers. And although of course he won in his own constituency, the Conservative Party, which had been responsible for the uh, appeasement policy, which a lot of people thought had got us into the Second World War in the first place, um, was going to be uh, punished by the electorate. And what the electorate also wanted in 1945, after six grueling years of war, was a, a better deal than they had in the 1930s. And that seemed to be offered them by the Labour Party, which was offering to nationalize the Bank of England, bring in a national health service, uh, make ma nationalize an awful lot, actually, of, uh, of British industry and um, in, institute a sort of new Jerusalem of welfare state uh, reforms. And so um, Churchill, although he believed in quite a lot of that and was, in fact, before the First World War, one of the founders of the British welfare state, um, just simply couldn't outbid the Socialist Party, the Labour Party, um, on any of those things. So he was um, he was defeated in that election. And that night after the, uh, sorry, that afternoon when the results were coming in, huge landslide victory for the Labour Party, his wife Clementine said to him, um, well, Winston, this could be a blessing in disguise. And Churchill replied, well, from where I'm sitting, it seems quite effectively. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the one of the guiding philosophies of, uh, of of Ambrose historical tours, and I mean probably any historical tour company, is that the best way to understand, or, or uh, especially military history, is, is to be there, is to go to the the spot where it happened. Um, I noticed that you have uh, walked the ground in Cuba, where uh, Churchill came under fire. You've uh, been to where his uh, trenches were in World War One, and probably to the sites of numerous other locations in uh, Churchill's life history. Um, obviously, research is the most important thing, interviews, documents, but, but how important do you feel it is and how useful is it for you to visit the places where stuff happened to understand the story? I think it's essential. I think as a military historian, um, unless one goes to the battlefields, if you're writing about a general uh, or somebody like uh, Churchill, it is, uh, it's like a detective not bothering to go to the scene of the crime. You absolutely have to be there. In um, my biography of, uh, of Napoleon, I've personally visited 53 of Napoleon's 60 battlefields. Um, right. and, uh, and the ones that I didn't go to um, were um, because they've been built over so much. And, and how much Red Bull did that take? <laughs> well, actually, it, it, you call this cocktail hour. It took me to ten countries, and uh, and so it was it was a wine fueled, uh, and, uh, and in and in Russia, of course, very important Russian battlefields are vodka fueled, um, and uh, and it was beautiful and great fun. And I'm very fortunate to have uh, a wife who actually loves going on battlefield uh, tours. I. On <laughs> On the day that I proposed to her, um, I said to her, now we're going to Lake Como. And she said, oh, how lovely. And I pointed out that actually we were going to visit where Mussolini was shot. As you would. After <laughs> As one does. Yes, exactly. Um, 
on, a, on the first day of our honeymoon, I took her to a Japanese um, concentration camp in, uh, in Thailand. So all in all, it's very helpful. We've been to Russian tank museums. We've been to Auschwitz. Uh, I, 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 it's not easy being the wife of a military historian. I'm very fortunate I've got one who's interested. My wife would agree with you, all right. All right. <laughs> yeah, I think that, but uh, it's, a, it's a very useful. And, and I want to... Well, can I just, uh, on, on the serious side, though, yes. uh, um, the, the key thing about visiting the battlefields um, is not just the battlefields, the, the places where the decisions are taken and so on, um, is that, and especially this is true of battlefields, is that it's only when you stand where the decision maker, where the commander is standing, that you can get a sense of the topography of the battle. You can see what the commander could see at the time. And you see this all the time at Waterloo, of course, being a classic example, but also at the Battle of Balaclava. When you get up onto that uh, hill in, uh, in the Crimea, um, and you can see how Lord Raglan might have sent the charge of the Light Brigade down the wrong valley because of the placing of the um, of the commander. Why uh, the Battle of Salamanca, for example, Wellington had to crisscross um, riding miles upon miles on his horse to make sure that he got the topography of the battlefield right. And it's very difficult to write the, st the story of a battle for a reader if you haven't been there, because the reader, quite rightly, just doesn't trust your judgment. Yes. Well, I, I wanted to, as we're, we're just a few minutes away from wrapping up, but, but you know, one of the great, if, if there's a positive to the um, pandemic that we're in now, it's that we get to see inside of the houses of so many people that we hadn't seen inside before. And I wonder if you could, could give us the 90 second version of what's there behind you uh, on the wall. <laughs> oh, right. Well, well, that is a, a rather wonderful map of all the places that Winston Churchill visited during the Second World War, everywhere he went. Uh, so you can see him crossing the Atlantic 12 times, going to visit Cairo, up to, um, to Moscow. Um, in the, this is my, um, uh, it's a sort of um, little bit of historical memorabilia I have down there. I have Winston Churchill's bow tie and his hairbrush. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lock of Napoleon's hair in there as well. Various uh, letters from historical figures. That up there is um, the invitation to William Pitt the Younger's funeral. Um, I've got uh, What to Do If the Invader Comes, which was sent to every house in southern England in 1940, in June 1940. It tells you things like, um, do not believe rumours and do not spread them. Things like that. Anyway, bits and pieces... Uh, that's there is rather lovely. That's a um, that's a actual piece of money from the siege of Khartoum, um, General Gordon um, siege of Khartoum. So uh, yes, lots of what my wife calls bric-a-brac. And, and, and you have Han Solo, Rick. Now this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll show you something. I else. Know. <laughs> How jealous you guys must be. And that's a that's a six pounder that was fired at the Battle of Waterloo. Now that. All right. All right. <laughs> That's a piece of shrapnel fired on DA. Uh, oh, my God. Fantastic. A church in Trivier, Normandy. So, all right. All right. I've got a little bit of sand from Iwo Jima, if you want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> and Robert, thank you so much thank for joining us. It's been a delight. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks very much, Rick. Thank you hour. I know you've had a busy day and a busy weekend. Stay well. Keep writing. We look forward to the next book, however many years now it is. Can't wait to read it. And I want to just say much. one more time. Huh? <laughs> Did you hear it? I think we're good. Thank you, Andrew. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Oh. All right. So I um, I think I just hit the wrong button there right at the very end. Yes, you um, did. We got through it nonetheless. I was trying to hold up a Andrew's book again. So if he's still watching, he can see that uh, um, we have Churchill walking with destiny uh, and Andrew Roberts. Boy, he was terrific.
It was wonderful. Yes. We I are we are still on. He was, he was pardon? I said I had I had to stop trying to ask all the questions. Well, no, I uh, I I totally thought you were uh, you were doing a great job. So uh, we're going to play one more time. Well, we can play our open. It can be our close too, right? So our brand new open. We thank everybody for coming. Oh, but before we do that, we should mention who our guest next week is. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, Eric Flint, uh, former combat historian uh, for the U.S. Army, is our guest next week, I believe. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, we're going to be chatting with him about his work as a combat historian, and he has also done quite a bit of travel. Some of the folks may know him from uh, some of the tours that we've done. So I think that should be a very interesting as well. And uh, pardon? Oh, always, always more on the ghost army. And so, um, you know, we'll, I, I we'll get. Know, to I've told you this, but I've had some, one of our uh, listeners said that his way to get through lockdown is on Sunday night. Um, he pours a cocktail, as you do. Um, and every time you or I mention Ghost Army, he takes a drink. <laughs> the poor man should go into a program immediately. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us today on History Happy Hour.